Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio with an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording. Upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms and we have our own apps for Apple and Android. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. Hey guys, welcome back to the Nina Casa show. I have no idea why I sound so upbeat because I literally, um, that is one way of, um, you know, putting a dampener on, on your weekend. Um, really, really average performance. Um, nil nil against Chelsea. And um, joining me on this podcast, I have two incredible guests. So I'm just going to intro them both in together. It's Shri and Tad. Tad and Shri, welcome to the show. Hey Nina, thank you so much for having us uh, hey, after such a dra- drab, drab performance from both teams, I would have to say. Mm, absolutely. And Shri, um, it's great to have you back on as well. Yeah, again, once again, I come on when we have drawn the game. But I think at this point, I would take a draw over a loss. This is also very, very true. Right, guys, before we kind of get into your, I mean, you've kind of touched on how this game was. and listeners know how the game went so you know what let's let's just go straight into it so of course over the weekend we lost to Brighton to Diva and then we beat Wolves and I guess the biggest thing was going to be what kind of players is Jurgen Klopp going to pick for this game so what did you make of the starting lineup because he kind of for me steered more towards the Wolves starting 11 in my opinion it was more you know of that kind of persuasion but um, what did you make of the starting lineup did anything surprise you I, I was pleasantly surprised that he kept the same midfield mm. um, from the yeah. Wolves game. I thought they deserved to stay in, mm-hmm. and I'm glad he used, well, at least I hope he used that sort of um, adage of if you've played well, you keep the shirt, because the performances of those they've come in for have not been good this season, in my opinion. And it, it the players needed to know that they're being dropped because of performance not being dropped because of um, it's, a, it's a cup game or yeah, we're, we're, we're nursing your injuries. It has to be, you're being dropped because you've been terrible this season and you need to step your game up. So the, I, I was okay with the, the lineup. My only worry was, and it kind of came to fruition in that game was yeah. Yeah. with Elliot and Gakbo, we don't really have pace aside from Salah up top. And when you then need to stretch teams, it's quite difficult to do it. And which was pretty much the uh, the whole of our attacking um, issues in the first half. That's also a good shout. I thought you were going to allude to obviously he had to play Milner, but when Mudrich came on and how you know he had him on toast a few times, which I'm sure we'll talk about as as we carry on. Um, Shri, I'm going to come to you because I think Tadeva hit the nail on the head. I want to get your thoughts on the starting lineup and the fact that Jurgen Klopp now. I feel like players could have so many average performances and they would still get picked. So what did you make of the starting lineup? And do you agree what Tadeva said that is quite refreshing for players that played well to kind of keep their position and start in place? In a way, yes, I was surprised because we have seen before that Klopp says a lot of things, but what he does is quite different from yep. what he says. But uh, I was actually surprised Nabi started not because he doesn't deserve to. I was just, I cannot actually recollect when he started two games in a row last. So I really thought we were maybe going to protect him again once more and put him back again on the FA Cup. Uh, but otherwise, I think cons- considering Nunes was just back, Trent has been just back, I think that's the lineup we could have gone with. But also in, on merit, I think even Milner had a good game last game. I think uh, defensively, uh, I wouldn't say, I think he's he's more... Okay, he was more okay with the lineup we wanted to play in the midfield. So I don't think I had any complaints. But as Tad says, I really thought it was going to be Elliot on the right, uh, Gakpo on the left, and uh, Salah down Not the middle. Central. That's what yeah, I was. That's hoping. exactly what I thought as well, Shri. That is exactly what I thought. Because it doesn't seem, it didn't seem to make sense. You were putting literally two people off 
what they would prefer doing especially it's it's an evolving lineup gakpo is settling in he's already rushing things get him to a position is more accustomed to elliot just cannot play on the left so the only position he can play is on the right only challenge would be maybe sala against three central defenders but again he was anyway isolated on the wide wide right so not much would have been different so i think that is the only thing i would have thought we would have started with and you know what seeing as you both went there let's talk about that you know um tadeva shri just hit the nail on the head that's initially what i thought as well well obviously elliot's going to be on the right because he's a right sided attacker gakpo was brought on for the left side maybe we see more salah in a bit more of a fluid position central you know challenge that chelsea defense um with his pace and you know like maybe have some joy against them um, uh, you know tiago but of course that you know that didn't happen and i found that very very strange the fact that he played players out of out of their like comfortable positions i mean and as a result i do feel like our attack was really really snuffed and stifled it it just didn't in the first half certainly it just wasn't clicking i mean th- i mean there was a little maybe chance around about 6 minutes where salah does find gakpo but um he shoots over and gakpo does you know fire over a fair few bit but i mean what did you make of that because i found that very strange i don't know if him and pep guardiola have an unwritten rule this season that let's just try weird stuff and see which one of us can figure a new way of playing or or system out quicker than the other because both managers are making very weird decisions and especially for a time period when we're struggling as much as we are just play players in the positions they're most comfortable in that should be at least the base line yes. that you start games off with then you can build onto the tactics and and the way you want to play but at least play players where they're comfortable and i thought it was so risky having milner starting and having sala on that right hand side as well because if if they decided to double up on that side um it could have been pretty dangerous quite early on but we got away with it in that sense but yeah it it's weird that both pep and klopp are just they seem to be doing sort of the hipster thing or the alternative thing instead of just do the basics right first and then we'll figure It'll out all of the other stuff later yeah nope could not agree more um shri yeah um it feels like um just keep things simple right so i want to get your thoughts on this because yeah. tadeva just touched on something and he goes you know eh, you know mosala on the right was a bit dangerous now now i'm going back to the man city game and i think milner played right back right and i think elliot did really really well shielding him in that game you know he kind of kept what he needed to do and i just thought maybe that would have made more sense if elliot was on that side i mean what did you make of the attack and jurgen klopp just not playing him in that comfortable position i mean we've got gakpo and under normal circumstances jurgen klopp would not play gakpo because he likes he used to like to phase players in which made complete sense but we are in a situation now where we have to throw players into deep end if you are going to throw the player into a deep end because you don't have the strikers and you don't have the reinforcements then at least play him where he's able to shine and feel a bit more confident and maybe he'll get a goal and it kind of like i don't know um gives him that sort of spark to kind of fit into the team and there's a sense of confidence yeah i i think the main problem was i i thought with the back line i thought maybe we should have tried targeting uh, thiago silva and mm-hmm. chaloba together that quadrant but the problem was uh, with elliot he doesn't have the pace to beat the man and take it down the line he wasn't comfortable cutting in so if you saw elliot i think first seven or eight times he got the ball he had nowhere to go he basically passed the ball back so we were just yeah. not doing anything when elliot got the ball i think in gak gak pa at least say he could cut in make things happen more than what mm-hmm. elliot would have done on the left yep. so we let basically silva had no problem like silva was voted man of the match but he basically did nothing the whole yep. game chaloba did nothing silva did nothing they had nothing to do this was this was as comfortable as you could get no pace no creativity we weren't good like taking the ball down the line we couldn't cut in we basically did nothing in attack So that was one of the worst 45 minutes in terms of attack i can ever remember yeah go compactness tactical discipline all were good but like you cannot even recollect a single moment of great things happening in attack no i i think that's fair and um shri i'm going to stick with you because 
oh my gosh, I very nearly had a scare around about two, about three minutes, have it goal. I mean, obviously it was, it was ruled offside and thank God, because I can't believe they literally had like, they had like three touches, um, you know, like of the ball in, in our half and none of our defences were alert to it. Now, again, talk to me about that because I really, really do worry about us on set pieces now. Yeah, there's literally no height in the team, especially with the midfield. We lined up, there's no midfield height. Uh, we put in, we're just lucky. I think Miller was just, you could say, the first pass, maybe Miller played everyone on side, but thankfully, once Havertz, the ball and went into Havertz phase of play, we will say, but that was, as you said, that was the first set piece. It went in, we, we were saved, but there were so many set pieces where we struggled. A combination of lack of height and, I, I don't know, let's call it some sort of marking. I, it's really scary. I think open play, we have come up quite a bit, say, last couple of games, but like, we are going back an era now, talking about set pieces again, being like, every set piece is a blood pressure shoot up for me personally. Just cannot handle it, and and we and also I think we recognize that, but we still kept g- giving away free kicks, giving away corners. It's almost like we know it's a problem, but we did nothing to rectify it. Okay, one, okay, you try to defend better, but try to cut it off at source, close down the man. No, we won't let the ball go. Yes, we don't care. So we kept giving away chances as well in terms of corners, free kicks. Yeah, Oliver was absolutely garbage, but taking that out. I think we also kept giving away a lot more chances knowing that's the practical weak point with how Chelsea plays. They aren't going to create much in open play either. It's like both teams not coming into the pitch not wanting to score. So set piece was the only chances and we kept giving them away. Absolutely. And to Diva, I mean, how close were you to thinking, oh gosh, here we go again when that happened? Oh, absolutely frustrated with that because... The irritating thing for me was it's not a goal that we conceded because of the substitutions that we've made, so to speak, in 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 open play, let me say it that way. Because a lot of the complaints from people with um, why the midfield needed to change was, you know, we have runners just coming through from midfield, we're not making challenges in midfield, and then they score off of a set piece. And it's like, if you then go and lose that game, because let's say you lose that game 1-0, it's not because of the changes that they've made. So that was what frustrated me the most. And then we ended up seeing, you know, throughout the game that we were horrendous in set pieces. They looked dangerous every single time they yeah. had a set piece, um, which was quite alarming. But it, 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 it is interesting that he did go with that midfield three and Elliot as well. Um, in in terms of height wise, I think the the issue for Klopp with with the lineup was the complaints have been okay. Give people that are playing well the the jersey, right? Then you look at the play. All the players that played well were the short players, so to speak. So it's like, okay, well, what do I do? Do I do I put them all in, um, or do I leave someone out? And if he leaves someone out, then he's being a bit of a hypocrite by leaving one of the players that didn't play well. So I think he was in a difficult place. He, I think he was hoping that the players would at least play with confidence. Um, but yeah, when, when they scored that goal, I was very frustrated. Uh, I thought it was going to be a long afternoon. Uh, but I'm glad that he got called off and, and at least we were able to try and get into the game not having to come from behind like usual. Yeah, absolutely. And you're right. On set pieces, Tadiva, I thought we looked absolutely um, woeful, and um, which is a stark difference to how Liverpool used to defend on set pieces. And I think where it really became apparent to me was the Brentford game, where I thought we were absolutely dreadful. And then I've kind of noticed it more and more and more. And um, I think you have to, Tadiva, I'll stick with you because, um, you know, I thought, you know, Chelsea did apply, you know, a little bit of pressure on us. I mean, you know, it was a nothing kind of game, but I, I have to now look back at maybe some of the significant moments of the game and that Ali save, you know, um, I think it was around about 31 minutes where he had to have like cat like refre- reflexes on um Oh gosh, I'm going to butcher his name, so please forgive me. Um, Badiashil, is that how you say it? Badia Shile, I think. Yeah, Badia Shile. Thank you, thank you. 
plus, but no cigar. But yes, um, you know, a shot for me. But you know, Ali, you know, Ali saves us there because they were, you know, they were having a little bit of joy. They were like, uh, you know, I don't know. But, um, I thought Havertz was doing quite well in, um, you know, um, playing yeah, up the... up behind our defense and things. Yeah, and look, if if it wasn't for Allison, we would be way 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 down in the in the league table i think um he he's the one player in this team that can hold his head up high and say i've actually played well this season um and we've needed him to play well because of how poor we've been it's insane how good he is and how good he's been able to remain despite everyone else's level dropping i don't think there's anyone else in the team that I can point to and say they are playing at the same level that they played either last year or the last couple of years. Whereas Allison is needing to pull off some insane saves and, and play really, really well. So I think the, the, uh, the good thing for this season is we at least have arguably the best goalkeeper in the league or in the world at the moment. And he's just plugging holes um, whilst we're deciding whether or not um, we want to play in terms of the rest of the team deciding whether or not we want to play or not this season. Sure. And Shri, I'm going to come to you because, you know, we're talking about the attack and I thought two of the chances, um, again, we'd not had a shot on target. Um, uh, it was it fell to, uh, on the 38th minute to Thiago um, uh, when, we, when the Reds started playing some pressure, which was quite good. But, you know, two of the shots from Gagpo were around about six minutes where Salah played him in. And then Gagpo does really well on 19 minutes where he dispossesses Hall and takes a shot and he, he fires high. Now, you guys are really, really technical. And I was actually really looking forward to speaking to you about this because talk to me about his technique because I was watching it with my brother and he was like, he's Dutch. And like, I think naturally we just think Dutch players are very, very technical and very, very gifted in that regard. He's like, why? He, why is he like sort of drawing back why is he putting his you know why is he like sort of leaning back he should be into that shot because when you lean back you fire high and wide I mean I want to get your thoughts both of you actually just talk to me about this I mean what did you make of, of that so I, I think in terms of obviously I think we've, we saw a lot in, with Nunes as well in terms of snatching you rushing chances I think we are He's that desperate, say, to score. I think sometimes you actually have more time than you realize. There are options available, but obviously he, he's so desperate to score. Because I've seen him a lot. His technique isn't that bad as it looked like in that moment. Obviously, I think it's more of a question of decision making. I wouldn't say nerves. I, I think it's it's more that urge to score. I think ah, there, okay. there is a realization that there is actually more time for decision making than he realizes he has. That is what I'm just going to put it. He, he was snatching at chance. It was not only that. You could see a lot of instances where he was in an urgency to make a decision when he had more time to maybe make a better decision, which he could have utilized. But I think maybe he needs to just get one in it. Even if it just rolls in off his knee, I think that will get bet better, I hope. That's what I'm thinking. I'm just putting it down to that because clearly his technique isn't that bad as we have seen maybe a couple of times in the last couple of games. Absolutely. And if it, and if it is decision-making, then surely, Tadiva, that in itself just kind of gets better, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it definitely gets better. And remember, this is also a player coming into a, te a new team. So he's got a lot of information he has to think about throughout a game. Okay, do I press now? Do I cover this man? Do I drop back? What kind of runs are my teammates making? All of this stuff is new um, to him and all of the stuff he's thinking about constantly throughout the game, opposed to, let's say, Asala knows most of those things. So his mind is a lot clearer during the game. So by the time it comes to a shooting opportunity, he's probably so exhausted mentally in any case. Now I have to concentrate on shooting. I think the, um, Shri mentioned the, the key thing there. It's desperation. You can see he's desperate to score a goal. And in that desperation, he's rushing things a bit too much. Um, and I bet you if, if you spoke to him after the game, he would say, you know, for example, that shot when he was leaning backwards, I know I shouldn't have been leaning back. Like these are things he knows he should be doing. It's just... In the moment, you so, just make it, yeah. Yeah, in that moment, you're so desperate to, to, 
to score. You're desperate to prove yourself. This is a, a big move. It's it's also a move that's been questioned by some people. So he's got a lot to prove um, and to show that there's a reason why they signed me. And at the moment, I think it's just, as, as Tree said, once that first one goes in, at least he can breathe and then just start to play his natural game, I think. I think that's fair. Um, what I mean again, um, uh, you know, I thought towards the end of the first half, I thought Reds um, uh, to be I thought the Reds were maybe moving the ball a little bit nicer um, in in the Chelsea half. They were trying to do something. I felt like, well, okay, it was it was it wasn't the best, but it felt like oh, it was a stark difference to what I saw against Brighton, where you know we were sort of having the ball, we were sort of trying to chase it down, there was a bit more energy about us. And the first shot did, I mean, for on target from us, which is quite hilarious, was on the 38th minute by Thiago. I mean, did you feel in that little moment where the Reds looked like they were kind of applying some kind of pressure on on Chelsea? Yeah, I, I, I think so. And as the home team, I think you expect that to come at some point in the game where you do put pressure on. And we saw it um, in the first half, I mean, in the second half as well, which I'm sure we'll get onto. But I, I think the interesting thing as well is both teams didn't want to lose this game. Like in terms of, they were both desperate not to lose it. As much as they wanted to try and win it, they did not want to lose it. And it was quite cagey at times from from both teams. The passing was a bit unsure a little bit of hesitation in the decision making with the passing and the execution so all of that i think played into maybe the the lulls that we saw in the game the the misplaced passes the frustration the lack of creativity it wasn't very crisp passing confident passing knowing what you you know exactly what you're doing and then also we have to remember this team um so to speak that we had on the pitch has only played once against wolves and the game they played against Wolves was very much a basketball end-to-end style of game, whereas this one was more a cagey, um, try and control, try and not make silly mistakes type. Of. So it's a completely different style of game, which means the the free areas on the pitch are going to be completely different to the free areas and spaces that were against Wolves. So again, it's a team that, yes, they've had one game together and to build that familiarity, but... It's a different style of game that they had to handle today. And you could see some of the hesitation was in there of players that just haven't played a lot of football together. And it was equally the same for Chelsea. It was a really cagey game, you're right. And I think both teams were eager not to lose. And I thought, you know, certainly Jurgen Klopp's um, subs um, in the second half towards the end certainly signalled that as well. Um, and also the options that he had on the bench as well. Me, I'm going to come to you. I mean, what did you make of it? Because obviously this was a bit more of a tactical kind of game in the sense that we can't lose the game. So how do you think the Reds fared in the first half trying to deal with that technical kind of battle? Uh, I think uh, uh, we have seen two games in a row. Obviously, we... We, I think they have just focused on a couple of high aspects in terms of maintaining the compactness and shape in both in terms of width and in terms of squeezing the area. And the main thing is not being open in transition. I think it's quite clear. It's it's like, uh, I think, borrowing, say, maybe some analogy from my day job, it's almost like they've realized this is P1. If we need to fix this, other things can wait. It's like we are fixing Ooh. things while they are in motion. So the, obviously they have fixed one thing. They are trying to stay compact. Again, I'm just this is just I'm thinking maybe tactically I'm wrong. It also means that when you are so compact, there are just so many players more in a small space. So which means you need better ball control. You need to make faster decision making in midfield. But we we do, did not have that much technical players to hold the ball. If you see, I think I'm not seeing the numbers, but I'm quite sure first half our passing stats would be horrid. I'm not sure anybody would have had anything near 80% passing except maybe the defenders. We just couldn't hold the ball because the space was so compact. There were so many players in the midfield area that you needed to find space, but you also needed to have almost pass it in an instant. You needed to make a decision before the ball arrived to you. And I didn't think we had the players to execute that. But I think obviously we are fixing... we are fixing one major problem and compromising on other things i think that's what i would i would not uh, i think the point i i'm trying to make is it's okay not to score and not lose as Tad says rather than not score and lose also i think it's one step at a time i don't think 
I think the team has so many problems. We have personal problems. We have tactics problems. We have fitness problems. We can't win duels. We are still late getting to the ball when the ball just pings around in the midfield. There, are, it's there is no quick fix to this. There are so many problems which will need tweaking over time. Uh, uh, maybe different coaching. We need players who are injured coming back in. Trying, we are also trying multiple things in terms of system wise, personal wise. We have Gakpo coming in. Trying to settle into an already dysfunctional team, so we have a yeah. hell of a lot of problems. I think we can only fix one at a time. The good thing I would say is two games in a row. It is progress in terms of transition, but again, I'm not going to go overboard in it because we are talking about Wolves and Chelsea. Both teams cannot even spell the word attack, leave alone actually attacking. So I'm going to reserve judgment on how it works. But I think there is at least signs that we have identified the core problem and looking to fix this. Because as Stad says, there is zero chance we are going to retrieve anything from games if we constantly are behind. And we need to catch up. The worst case we are looking is a draw. So I think it's a good setup that we try to extend it. It's almost like the Mourinho logic, like do not concede, do not concede and try to snatch a winner somewhere. Which is what we did at Wolves as well. And I hope we were looking for some sort of an individual brilliance to take us over the line, which is yeah. okay. I always, yeah, I always find as well that when, when we sort of um, uh, go a goal behind, which has been a common trend this season, it's almost like you're looking down. Um, uh... Are you that person who has everything? The coolest merch and those must-have fan threads? Well, over at our Anfield Index shop, we've gone that extra mile when it comes to pimping up your Liverpool collection. From our popular range of bespoke design t-shirts, sweaters, hoodies and hats, to our signature edition mugs, prints and coasters, all provided with fast worldwide shipping. We have something for every red. We also stock official LFC merchandise and are licensed with the Premier League and UEFA to sell official iron-on shirt badges and sleeve patches. As a listener to this podcast, you can get 10% off everything with coupon code AIPRO10. Just head over to AnfieldIndex.shop or find us on Etsy by searching for Anfield Index. Down the barrel and um, uh, with the way the team are playing right now, you you have very little hope in terms of where the goals are going to come from. Tadeev, I'm going to come to you because um, I want I want you to quickly kind of talk about the midfield. I mean, what did you make of it overall in general? Um, one thing that I kind of noticed was maybe I'm comparing it to the last you know Premier League game, which was Brighton and. I, I found that they okay, they might have not been great in terms of, you know, their passing and stuff, but I felt like the shape was a bit more compact. I felt like they were kind of playing like in, in like a triangle formation. The, there was that close proximity between them. And I kind of even saw instances where Naby Keita was um, you know, sort of stopping them from transitioning and sort of um, you know, hooking the ball off them and trying to move it forward. You know, tr- basically acting as somewhat of a shield. I mean, I want to get your thoughts on that. It wasn't crisp, but I felt like it was a step in the right direction where I felt like in the past our midfield has just got acres of space where players can just the opposition can just play through us. I agree. It 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 was it was promising is is what I would say they're not going to get it right off the bat. And the issues that we have aren't going to be fixed in one day. It's going to take a while. And I hope, um, I think I saw in the chat, and maybe this is one of the questions we'll, we'll address later, later on, but I hope that Klopp does stick with this 11 in the next game because give them time to get used to each other, give them time to gel and know each other's styles of play and patterns because... As Shreya said, we we're building the base of at least we're not conceding. We're, we're a bit tougher to get through, especially in midfield. The runners don't necessarily escape as quickly as they they did with the previous midfield iterations that we had in the past. So I think it's promising. It's not great. It's not fantastic. It's I think fans need to accept that we're not going to be playing free flowing, beautiful to watch football at the moment because of trying to address the the issues and knowing the players that we had on the bench i definitely think that was the intention in this game just guys let's stay in this game keep it level i've got firepower off the bench if need be with that we can bring on and and get us a goal we should have enough to win this game one nil basically it is kind of the mindset going into this game um obviously we then 
draw the game nil nil. But that that thing of being combative in midfield, I saw that Batic, I think, was a bit unlucky with his yellow card. Um, mm. But even after he got his yellow card, he didn't shy away. He didn't hide. Whereas you've seen that in the past with players all around the world. It, the moment you get a yellow card, especially an early yellow card, and you're a young player making a, a start ahead of players that, in, in my opinion, have been dropped, he, he could have easily hidden in that game and not gone into challenges and tried to be cautious. But he carried on playing his normal game, which was good to see. Thiago was good as, as, as usual, good to great. Um, Keita was good. But both Thiago and Keita may be a bit sloppy with their passing. They might need to tighten that up a little bit. But again, that goes to... These are players that play very high, uh, low percentage passes in terms of completion. They play risky passes. And unless they know exactly how the runners in front of them are going to run, those passes aren't always going to come off. So the more football that they get with the players in front of them, the more they understand the movement of the players in front of them and how we're going to move around the pitch with this compact style of play, the more accurate they're going to be with their passes. So I'm not too worried about Keita and Thiago misplacing passes in a game like this because they're not, they're not players that are going to consistently do that. It will only improve for, for those type of players. And that's a really good shout that you made about misplaced passes to an attack, which is somewhat new, let's be honest. You know, it's not the attack that we're used to. We've got two brand new strikers in there who are still sort of... Nunes looks a little bit more settled, but, you know, Gakpo's literally just come in. So, naturally, there is going to be a bit of a confusion between them. I mean, Tadiva, you've kind of answered the question there from uh, in the midfield perspective. The question was from You Never Walk Alone Foodie, and his question was a question for the panel. What changes would the panel make for the next game, or do they stick... Um, to the same starting eleven. I mean, Tadiva, you've answered the midfield one. Um, what do we do in attack and defence? I mean, I think just stick with Gomez right now because I think Matip's had a bit of a ropey moment as well, and I thought Gomez did all right today. Yeah, I think if if you listen to the commentators, they always mention the insane amount of partnerships that Liverpool have had at the back this season. Let's get a centre-back pairing and stick with it. And I think at the moment, based on form and injuries, these are the two players that should be starting, Konate and Gomez. I, I thought it was interesting that Konate was more on the right-hand side today. Um, usually he's the one that flips to the left-hand side. But anyway, it, it, they looked good together. It was fine. Um, I'm happy for that to continue. Obviously, Robertson starts. That's fine. Um, Trent is probably then the one that comes in. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. Um, that makes sense. He's, he he had a niggle. We're not going to risk him. It makes sense. So that would be the back four of Trent and Robber as the wing, uh, the fullbacks, Gomez and Kanata at the at centre backs. Midfield, I'll keep it the same um, for the reason I mentioned earlier. And then up front, the only change for me would be personally, I would put Harvey Elliott on the right, um, Nunes on the left, Salah up top for now. Because I think Nunes and, and Salah can become a two-man attack in the, in, in, within the game if we needed to, to go that way. Um, there's a lot more fluidity with that lineup. We can go 4-2-2-2 two, two, two effectively with that type of lineup and probably put um, Naby Keita as, um, on the left-hand side as, as sort of the left winger, so to speak. He's played that before for us. Um, Elliot as the right type winger and then Salah and Nunes up top will kind of be the shape that the team ends up and then it would be a two of Basetic and Thiago in midfield if they want to switch it but then obviously Klopp would start with the 4-3-3 so that's how I would do it so that at least you can make changes tactically if need be within the game the and then Gakpo off the bench I think I think it's better at the moment for him to be coming off the bench, um, playing against players that have played 70, 75 minutes, just so that he can get that goal. We need him to get that goal. And yes, there's the benefit of starting a game that you've got more time to obviously try and get that goal. But I think he'll be more impactful coming off the bench when usually uh, in Liverpool games, we're more offensive later into games because either we're trying to 
um, come back from behind or trying to get a goal. It's really that we're leading by a lot of goals and we need to sort of shut up shop. So I, I, I wouldn't mind um, Gakpo coming off the bench. Keep Elliot on. Um, he's playing well at the moment, uh, relatively speaking to everyone else. So yeah, that's how I'd go with it. The really same question to you. Yeah, uh, before I answer the, uh, the team question, maybe one more thing I wanted to make uh, uh, additional point about the setup was I, I don't think it's only the midfield. I think we are playing tactically compact as a unit, I think. That's the key. There is no solo individual presence. I think we are cohesively moving up and down the pitch because I think it's very easy to just criticize the midfield. But whole problem has been the gaps between the three lines. So I think between the attack, I think attack also not pushing up too much. I think the attack midfield gap has been compact and the defenders are also pressing high. The high line is also keeping the pitch compact. So basically, it's the original setup which we have known. It's just that it has no direction in terms of attack. That is the only thing. So it's not only the midfield, the whole compression of the whole field by how we have set up as a team, I think that is key. I, I, in terms of ensuring there are no gaps. So that is one thing. In terms of the team, I'm a bit conflicted. I know we have a weak gap now. But I think in terms of backline, as Tad said, I think it's going to be Trent, the same back to, I would say, Robo starts. Midfield, I think I'm just worried maybe Thiago needs a break. He's literally played every game. And I would prefer, again, if I had to sacrifice a game in between, it would be the FA Cup. So, Thiago, but the question is again, who plays otherwise? I, I think maybe Nabi comes on the right and he maybe puts Hendo on the right hand side and Nabi plays on the left. Start budget. This is just to shield Thiago. It's not like uh, Thiago shouldn't play. And in attack, the, again, I think it's a question we might want to talk Nina later is what what do we do with Salah? It's like there's nothing seems to be happening. Maybe put Elliot on the right, put Gakpo down the middle and Nunes on the left and make Salah come in later. Uh, that's what I would do. Maybe try to ensure if Gakpo can get off the mark, put Nunes on the left. Uh, with uh, how Brighton play, put Nunes on the left and let Elliot play on the right. Hello, I'm here to annoy you. I'm here to annoy you into listening to more of me and more of others on EPL Index. We don't just have the Anfield Index stuff. We've got EPL Index as well, which covers the entirety of the Premier League. And we have three podcasts and a whole bunch of really good writing on EPLindex.com. The podcasts are my own two-footed podcast, which is every day at 4 p.m., Monday through Friday, covering the whole league. We have a Tad Predictable hosted by Tadiwa. You know Tadiwa. He does Anfield Index. He presents a Tad Predictable before every Premier League match week. And then Kevin DeVries and his crew on the EPL Roundtable there every week after the Premier League match week. So make sure you listen to everything we're doing on EPL Index and follow us there on Twitter at EPL Index. Thank you. Bye-bye. I like both of your shouts there with the, with the attack as well, like, you know, different options. I think, I think we can all agree we definitely need somebody threatening to come off the bench. And I mean, the, I think the last time maybe, I remember once Salah came off the bench and scored a really quick hat-trick. I can't think what game it was. But, you know, the, you know, so, you know, he's more than capable of doing those things. But I think we definitely agree that we, we need some firepower off the bench. And, you know, there is pace in our attack and against some tired defenders that could be quite a tasty prospect. I mean, I, for me, I I want to see Salah more more central. I want him more involved. And my personal opinion is I'd like to see sort of um, Salah start because I think what he does is he gives familiarity to the midfielders and familiarity for the Liverpool fans as well in terms of what he can do in attack. So but that's why I would start Salah, but I would, I would not let him hog the touchline, which has been a frequent thing this season. So that is something that we need to figure out for ourselves. So maybe Elliot on the right as things stand, um, Salah down the middle and Nunes on the left or, you know, however, or maybe we just change. I don't know if Jurgen Klopp is able to change up the formation, but for me, Salah has to be more in, in a closer proximity to um, the forward men. I mean, I'm really intrigued to see how Roberto Firmino is getting on with his um, rehabilitation because what I find is, um, uh, you know, 
I think Salah has a lot of joy when he plays with Roberto Firmino. I think that's fair to say. Would you agree, guys? I think so, yeah. Um, but this version of Firmino is, yeah, is the I'm... only question that I would have. Um, but yeah, it, I think he usually creates a lot of space for Salah. It is weird that we seem to be making game plans that involve less of Salah. <laughs> He's our best player. Like, yes. Surely would want him on the ball a lot, but it seems like the 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 patterns of play the style we're trying to use he's becoming less and less impactful in games and and that's a bit worrying it is it is really worrying um, you know our top goal scorer right there right guys i think we've kind of spoke we've answered the question we've kind of spoke about just Liverpool in general and of course touched on the first half um i'm going to move on to the second half and sheree i'm going to come to you because um second half starts no subs uh, it starts really well and, you know, Kanate has a shot, um, uh, fancies his chances, you know, fancies his chances and his look from far, um, uh, slightly wide. But what did she make of Liverpool's start? Because I felt like there was, I don't know what Jurgen Klopp said to him at half time. Clearly, he did not go for a half time sig break. He actually decided to speak to his players. And, you know, they came out with some tenacity. There was some ferociousness in the attack. I felt like, you know, um, Chelsea couldn't get out their half. I thought there was a really, really, really good amount of pressure. Certainly for the first, like, sort of seven minutes of that first half. I mean, you know, Keita has a shot as well, but a lot of pressure from the Reds, and it gave me a lot of positivity. Yeah, I thought, I thought it, was, it was just that we maybe that was a 10-minute spell, which I would say closes not in terms of the quality, but in just terms of the sheer pressure. We just didn't allow Chelsea to even get out of the half. Mm-hmm. In terms of sheer pressure, look looked like the Liverpool we knew. Uh, it was just. I think we just tried. I think that was. I think we one phase of play where we tried to snatch the game, as we, we have discussed before. We both teams were set up not to concede. It, it was just going to be a, maybe sustained pressure. But I think we do not have the quality, uh, nor the fitness. I think in terms of the people whom we are playing to sustain that. So I think it was just a burst of pressure. We tried to exit and snatch a goal, but obviously I think it settled down after a while. But I think that was the best phase of play you could say in terms of where we seem to have a semblance of control because for the first 45 minutes we didn't have any sort of control in terms of the when we had the ball we were all focused towards off the ball itself so that was the only phase of play where i thought we clearly dominated the game and looked like wanting to score i think the intent came only in those few minutes whatever it was yeah I, I think you're absolutely spot on there. And uh, Tadiva, what did you make of a uh, Liverpool sort of brighter start? Because um, it it was an awful first half. Let's be honest. So I was quite surprised to see the Reds apply that kind of pressure. It was so nice to see. Um, it was like we rolled back the years for a couple of minutes. The only issue was, and I kept saying, we need to score in this moment because yeah. um, with the amount of pressure we were putting on, we needed to at least get some sort of reward from it. And the moments when it started looking like, okay, we're not going to be able to do it, all it, it all stopped. The, yes. the, the tempo stopped, the, the intensity that we played with stopped. And the thing is, we've seen that a couple of times this season that in 10 minutes, maybe if we stretch it 15 minutes spells, we're able to bring back the old Liverpool or, or elements of the old Liverpool of mm-hmm. pressing, intensity, keeping the other team pinned back, driving at them, asking them questions, and then that's it. That's all the energy we, we've got, and then it, you know it, it, it slows down dramatically after that. So I think the only worry is we can't maintain it, and it's a shame that we didn't get a goal during that time period because... That that was our moment uh, in during the game to to try and get a goal. I think you've absolutely hit the nail on the head, which means that we need like you know clinical strikers then you know who are going to put away them chances if we're going to just perform in those moments in small bursts. Uh, I think you're both absolutely spot on, which is why you know we we need we need our strikers to have to be playing in positions that they are comfortable in and uh, you know shots that come to the players and you know they can be absolutely clinical Steve, i'll stick with you because at 54 minutes uh chelsea bring on their brand new shiny striker mudrit hall comes off and i feel like that's where again that's where it kind of shifts again and then it's it's 
Chelsea holding on, not trying to lose the game, and then th- then they sort of um try sort of um playing around our defense and try you know Ziyech tries hooking in balls to Mudrich and stuff, and you know he's trying to beat Milner for pace there. I mean, what what did you make of? Because I think that was the only burst of attack that Liverpool had, and then it was like sort of Chelsea having their moment when their brand new striker comes on. Yeah, he looked lively. Um... It, it's always a worry when, when Milner comes up against pace. But when Milner got that yellow card, he needed to take it. You could, yeah. you could see him chasing back and saying, yeah, th- this kid's going to absolutely rinse yeah. me here. Yeah. I have to take him out. Um, and that old ad- adage of either the ball or the man goes past, not both. And Milner decided the ball's already gone. So Mudridge can't go past me either. Um, yeah, he, he had a... A good cameo, I would say, uh, Madrid, and I think Chelsea fans will be excited by that. For us, um, it, even when we made our substitutions, I don't think we they energized us the way in which we thought they were going to. It, if anything, I thought Chelsea were a lot more energized by their substitutions than we were by our substitutions. I mean, we'll, um, we'll talk about the subs in a minute because obviously I, we will get to there. And Sheree, I'll come to you because obviously give me your thoughts on Moodrich. And um, you know, then obviously Jurgen Klopp responds on 62 minutes and brings on Darwin Nunes, which we needed. Um, I was quite surprised to see Keita come off. I mean, your thoughts on that one? So I, I think it's just obviously Keita is coming off what? 20, 30 minute cameos and then he's played 95, he's played 60. So we are talking 150 minutes. I'm Managing quite minutes. Sure that, I, obviously, it's not like he's consistently played 60, 70. Then 60, 70 going to 90, maybe going to 120 is understandable. Then say shooting directly from 30 to 150. I think, I, and I think for me, it is good news. Then it means that he obviously intends to pay Keta more. So I would say in terms of good news, I think the sub was right, but what we did to cover that sub, I was not. I was hoping he would taking off Keita for me was not a problem. I was hoping he takes off Elliot, but the, because the problem is if you didn't take off Elliot and you had to bring in Nunes, Elliot has to come into midfield. You are yeah. not going to want Elliot playing on the right with Milner when Mudrik is on, you, mm-hmm. because he provides no cover. Milner has no pace. You you literally need to double team on Mudrik to catch him, if especially if you're beaten. You need to double. If you notice, Milner literally was standing as close to Mudrik as he could and maybe on a bit more goal side because he he needs that couple of years. Otherwise, there's no way. The only time he was beaten was in a kind of a transition again. Uh, he was beaten in a transition and he had to take... And I'm happy. He, at least people are prepared to... We, we, we saw, was it the Leicester game where Henderson didn't make the tackle at all? Yeah. I'm okay, he made the tackle and took the card, I think. And that that was my worry. That was the only, but the good thing I would say, good thing is that was the only phase of play where you could see an open transition coming in. Because yep. the main, and I think that is, uh, I know I'm again veering back into tactics. I think that is one of the reasons why we are playing Gakpo down the middle is to our main problem has been the long ball from deep, where we just get they bypass the midfield. We are nowhere. And I think Gakpo's main role is sitting on the creator from the deep sitting on him. I think he played that role with Neves as well in the midweek where he just he, he just doesn't allow the long pass to come from deep. So that was the only moment of transition and once he took the yellow card I think uh, Milner needed to go though the last 20 minutes when Trent came on there were like five occasions where Trent, Trent was in a different geography to what Mudrik was. I was just praying that we were not going to get caught in transition. I think but that shape is what is helping us. I think it is not like the personnel is doing differently, but Gagpo sitting, not allowing a trans- long ball coming from deep, I think is the huge difference we are seeing. That is the big phase of play where we have literally caught a lot, like four or five times a game, the long ball from long diagonal from deep, where the runner makes the run from midfield uh, uh, in between our two centre backs. I think that long ball cutting out has taken out like I would say 50-60% of the big chances which we are going to face. So I I think the bad decision was putting Elliot in the midfield. I would have taken put in someone else, not in, someone who would do a bit more of a job on the right side of the midfield. That was what I was hoping for at that point. So I think a lot of I think our control went off not because Keita went off. Yeah, partly yes. We 
but the point is our replica the pe- person whom we put there had no idea what to do in that role either I think that's fair. Tadeva, I'll come to you. I mean, what did you make of the Nunes coming on? And of course, Jürgen Klopp then responding shortly after around about 71 minutes where he takes off Milner, brings on Trent. And um, the, the tactical change of Elliot in midfield, I think it's something that none of us really want to see. It doesn't really work um, in, in that regard um, in general. So what did you make of that? And then we'll obviously talk about the triple sub later on as well. But what did you make of just those changes? Yeah, and... and- Nunes came on and he played on the left a lot. And I thought, yeah. oh, okay, this is great. Him against Thiago Silva. So, you know, he can drag him out wide, burn him. He did have a one-on-one his... with him, didn't he? One yeah, yeah. He, he had that one-on-one. And Thiago just said, you're shooting with your left foot. I don't care what you think is yeah. happening. You should... He forced him that way. Yeah, I, thought, I thought Nunes could have been a bit uh, more clever in that situation and tried to... Um, dribble a bit more there and invite Thiago to make a challenge and then sort of push the ball past him and, and move around him because he's, he's a lot faster than him. Um, but we didn't get to see that. In terms of Elliot going into midfield, yeah, I, I, I don't like it. Um, but it, it seems to be one of those players that Klopp trusts. And if you look at our team and, and the options that we had off the bench, I don't really know what else Klopp would have done with, you know, if we look at the substitutions that he made, I don't see who else he could have either brought on. Um, I think the players that came on were the players that we expected to come on at some point in time. Whether you want them to come on or not, it it, it was going to happen. And then Elliot being one of the players that stayed on, it by default, it means he's, he's the one that then goes into that... Um, three-man midfield, unless you want Curtis Jones to go there um, and Elliot stays out wide, maybe that could have been an option, but we've not seen Curtis Jones do that too much this season. So it, it, it's frustrating, but it is what it is in terms of uh, the personnel that he has available and, and deciding not to sign a midfielder this uh, winter window so far. The other substitutions, Trent coming, I thought Trent looked quite sloppy at times. Um, obviously, just trying to maybe catch up to the pace of the game, not having played for, for a couple of days now, didn't play midweek either, suffering from that uh, niggle or slight injury, which caused him not to start this game. All of those factors maybe played played a part in, in his performance. But yeah, I, I didn't think Trent played all too well uh, in his cameo. And if if anything... Uh, Milner staying on, even though we know the the issues that he had, um, may have been better served. Uh, or I guess the 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 alternative shouts of put Trent in midfield could have been used in this game instead of Elliot. It's a really, really sticky one, isn't it? I mean, you're just looking at it and you're just thinking, like you said, those players you fully expect. And, you know, I, I'll be honest with you, Shri, I still thought maybe something can happen when Nunes came on, maybe Trent coming on, maybe he can play one of those majestic passes, which he has been do- doing since, you know, um, uh, coming back from the World Cup and things. You know, he's, his delivery has been quite excellent and, you know, quite consistent. So I thought maybe that is the moment of magic that unlocks things. And Tadeva touched on this, and I'm going to come back to Tadeva in a minute, but, you know, he thought that, you know, the, the subs would have more of an impact and maybe change the course of the game. For me, after those two subs, I was very, very um, underwhelmed, should we say, by the subs. Because on the 84th minute, of course, Klopp makes his triple sub and he brings on Henderson, Fabinho, who are senior players under normal circumstances. You think, yep, absolutely fine. But, you know, and take, and brings on Jones and takes off Elliot, Gakpo and Bajsetic. I mean, to me, at that point, I was like, he's just playing for a draw. He's just holding on now. And I, I, I think Bajetic at that point, you could see, I think there was a phase of play before where he, he was just literally struggling to move. So I think the changes, you could say, was, I think Elliot played again midweek. He needed to, but again, I, I think uh, this game had draw. I, I actually messaged you, right, Nina, mid halfway through half, half time because yes. it, it resembled it was destined to be a drop after the first 20 minutes because it was almost like both teams were just shit scared of conceding and just didn't want didn't bother even trying to score 
I think it needed an individual brilliant moment. Like Mudrick was the only one who seemed like creating something, and that was my worry with Trent because I know we we brought in Trent trying to one is obviously to save Milner, but obviously to see what he would do. But my biggest concern was I was actually thinking if there was a chance we were going to concede, it was when Trent was playing Mudrick because we had no cover with Henderson late on, and Trent, as I said, was. Somewhere else, most times in attacking phases of play, he was nowhere near Mudrik. I was just worried one moment of transition, we are literally dead. So that was the actual phase of play where I was really thinking we would concede. But as I said, Chelsea had no intention of scoring either. So I think, I would say it's an absolute drab game of football. I think it, like I think a lot of people have said this, this is what mid-table clashes look like, but it, like it, it looked like Burnley playing what Bolton Wanderers. That's what it sounded it oh. like when we played. There was, there was no purpose or direction to what either team were doing in terms of creating chances. It was like if if shit happens, great. Otherwise, cool. We'll both take a point. And to Divas, um, uh, what did you make of the triple sub? And then I've got a couple of questions here in Discord that I'm going to fire at both of you. Uninspiring. <laughs> Absolutely uninspiring, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. But yeah, the Basetich one was needed. He he looked like he had given his all. Yeah. Um, and then I, it, it's a nil-nil game. It you expect that Klopp's going to bring uh, those substitutions on. You know Henderson's coming on. You know Fabinho's coming on. And then it, I guess it was a, a coin flip between whether it's Curtis Jones or Oxley Chamberlain who comes on. But yeah, we. We desperately need the injured players to come back or to bring in uh, players in, in the transfer market because if if plan A doesn't work at the moment, there's not really much else that we can do at the moment in terms of changing games, in my opinion. Well, you know what? You've teed me up quite nicely there, um, Tadeva. You're, you're a natural host, evidently. Go and check out his podcast, A Tad Predictable. There you go. I'll put the plug out there for you. Um, the, I've got a question here in Discord from Vishal Mulchandani, and he wants to know, do Liverpool need to explore the law market? Because, of course, we're looking at the bench and we kind of talked about it and you've alluded to it. Do Liverpool need to explore the law market? And if so, are there any viable candidates for midfield ball winners? Now, I'm sat here and I'm thinking, do we really need a loan player? Because what does Jurgen Klopp do. He'll buy a third-rate player, he'll get injured and we'll never see him again. It happened in COVID season football, it's happened with Melo. I'm not even intrigued, I'm not even going to entertain that factor because it looks like he'll just buy a player just to shut us up. What do you make of that, Tadiva? It's so difficult. Low market is so difficult. And the, the issue for me is that I don't trust the loan market for Jurgen Klopp because I don't know if Jurgen Klopp's going to play a loan player ahead of players that have contracts. Yep. Like, I don't see how Jurgen Klopp justifies playing, even with Melo that we have now, when he becomes fit again, how is he going to justify playing him when he could be using those minutes to develop Basetic? Like, it, it just it just doesn't make sense to me that Klopp's going to use it the way that other clubs use it. You know, we saw uh, João Felix come to Chelsea. Obviously, he gets a red card, but yes, he gets thrown in straight away. Yeah. Like, there's no hesitation. You're playing. Um, these are the instructions. Go sort it out. For Klopp, it's going to take at least a month for that player to figure out um, what they need to do and for Klopp to actually trust them to throw them into any sort of relevant minutes. And by that time we're probably into the business end of the season where Klopp doesn't uh, trust the big squad. He usually then condenses the squad to only the few players that he does trust. So I, I think a loan market is just completely pointless. The player's not going to play much. It's not going to impact our season, I don't think. Um, yeah, it, it has to be a signing that Klopp is convinced is going to come in and make a difference. And at the moment, live, the coaching staff aren't convinced by a lot of the options that are being thrown at them. Let me say that. Yeah, uh, I would agree with you there, Tadeva. And uh, that's why I kind of came in there, Vishal, with my thoughts, because Jurgen Klopp just... And loan, loan players and Jurgen Klopp just do not mix. Shri, I'm going to come to you. Same question. I, I think more than loan, I think Klopp generally doesn't want to buy in Jan. He would buy in Jan only if that player 
cannot be attained during the summer there was a chance we were going to lose out i think leave loan market i don't think he's going to buy he usually prefers buying anyone in january even a permanent signing he would prefer buying it in the summer he would only buy the player if that player was a long term market so as and also what tadiva said by the time the player comes acclimatizes one it should be a player club wants and is available fits the profile and i don't think uh, with loan market the profile fit becomes very difficult because even if it's a slight fit by the time they get accustomed to the system 2 3 months are gone then they need to be fit there are so many parameters involved and and even if the loan say happen jan when you get a month more now we are what end of jan which means a month more is gone and knowing club he is in we have seen it hell of a lot of times he is in one he would take more bloodshed than do a short term fix we have seen it with the midfield situation we have seen it with the center back situation we have seen it a lot of times he prefers operating with sh- further short term losses than a short term fix so i don't think loan signing i'm not going to say not possible at all last time we thought so and we signed a player who who we like melo whom we didn't even expect to so i'm not going to say no but i don't think it make logical sense that klopp is going to sign a loan player for the second half of the season Yeah, I can't see it happening as well. And Shree, I'm going to stick with you because I've got another question here from Badger, the Badger Wolf. And um, he wants to know, is it best for our collective mental health to embrace lowered expectations for this season and be happy with consecutive clean sheets? So I'm not... I'm, okay, the mental health bit is a bit... I, I'm no expert to comment on. I'm not, but I would, say, I would say the most important thing should be there should be some... the two words i'm looking at is purpose and progress mm. and if we show semblance of both things in each game i'm happy because we as i said before we have so many problems i think even if we win like the leicester game one we all know we won but the, like we should have deserved to lose that there are a lot of games we should have deserved to lose so i think if we have a purpose like what do we want to achieve in this game and if we show progress towards that purpose i think that is what i'm going to expect i'm not having like top four champions league nothing we have so many issues we have so many injuries we have tactically screwed up whatever we had fitness wise we are nowhere near there is hundreds of problems so if i see game on game a consistency in terms of what we want to achieve and progress towards that then i am happy because now it's clear we want to set up tactically in a compressed space we don't want to allow transitions we are worried about open play chances big chances from open play maybe next focus might be set piece i think until we defend better i think attack it clearly seems like we are hoping individual brilliances can start but we are trying to ensure at least we have a point in every game and that that is not wrong yeah maybe for from liverpool 2 years ago it's frustrating it's exasperating but i think the reality should also set in we have brought this among ourselves now the next step is can we turn around the corner can we go on an upward trend it won't be great we all know it's not going to be great anytime soon uh, maybe till the injured players at least start coming in and there are more players who know our system and if there is progress in the right direction i am going to be personally satisfied Again, you're alluding to the fact that there's so much of a mess with this team that we have to fix one problem at a time. That's how we kind of find the solutions. To do the same question to you, because I don't know, like managing expectations. I mean, for me, where the Premier League is going now and where you see teams sort of like climbing up, like, you know, Newcastle are going to be a threat now and, you know, losing top four is so, so detrimental. And for me, like the bare minimum I'll take is like the COVID season of football where Liverpool have to finish top four. Like, I can't. like we need, we need something we have to be working for something whilst that i agree with shree there should be progress and purpose but there should be a goal to achieve yeah it, it i'm probably not one of the best people to give fans advice on how to handle a season because i i tend to be quite individual, like, it's an individual thing isn't it, it being a supporter it, it, it really is and and i tend to be quite black and white with uh, certain things especially you know i mean heading into this season i thought we we didn't do enough to challenge for the title so heading into the season i was expecting uh, you know us to be challenging for top 4 and then i saw the performances that we were giving this season and i was like 
right for me i don't i because i don't want to be and maybe i'm a spoiled fan or whatever you want to call it i don't want to be in europa league i don't want to be in europa conference Mm -hmm. i think it's pointless i think it's it um it just kills the legs of the players unnecessarily our focus as liverpool should be the league and champions league and if we're not in champions league getting back into champions league and the best way to get into Champions League next year would be if we have one game a week. Um, yeah. We've seen how it's benefited other teams in the past. And that's but, how we got Champions League football on the club, by the way, guys. Remember, exactly. we lost to Sevilla. We lost to Sevilla. Went out of Europe all together and we focused entirely on the league. And um, we finished top four and then we kind of established our place back in the Champions League. Exactly. My only worry, um, and I've been saying this for a couple of weeks now, is my only worry is if we don't make top four, I wouldn't be surprised if either Salah or Van Dijk get sold. That's my only worry of not making top four. But I don't, I, I wouldn't change that if we made Europa League or Conference. I still think one of those players would then be sold to sort of fund this rebuild that they're trying to to do. So, again, it, it, to me, I would rather be, I would rather us finish eighth or ninth and then sort of try and fix it in the summer and go again um, next season with a clean slate than hobbling to sixth or seventh. Um, I don't see how we make top four with the way we're playing at the moment, with the squad we have at the moment, with the injuries that we have at the moment. But Liverpool have surprised us in the past before. Um, you know, go and surprise me. Go, go do it. I'm, I'm happy to be proved wrong. Whenever I'm proved wrong, I'll, I'll say so. I'm, I'm, I'm not afraid of that. But the way we're playing at the moment, just expecting or hoping that Liverpool make it there, that that's not the type of fan that I am. And right or wrong, it, it, it just seems, um, for me, like within the 90 minutes, if I'm in the ground for those 90 minutes, I'll be cheering all of those 90. Minutes. I'll be backing the players. But I'm also a person that I can step back from situations, um, being fortunate enough to working in that industry and working with some of these people is I'm smart enough to know when a team is being negligent, when it's being good, when it's doing things, when it has opportunities to do things and doesn't. So it just frustrates me a lot. And this Liverpool team has been, for me, a wasted season, um, especially with some of the talent that we have. So I think it's just one of those where I've been a lot happier because I've, I'm not expecting much from Liverpool. Um, But as I said, some fans, it's the hope that drives them, you know, through the weeks and stuff like that. For me this season, I'm, my hope is I'm hoping for eighth or ninth, um, you know, out of, out of European football, I'm not expecting us to make top four and in not expecting us to make top four results like today make sense. A nil, nil draw against a top six team for a team that's going to finish eighth or ninth. Yeah, that seems about right. Is it frustrating when Liverpool don't win? Yes, it hurts when Liverpool don't win, but it's not affecting me and I'm not allowing it to affect me because I don't feel like the club has done everything they could to give us the best possible chance this season. So I don't see why I should give everything that I should and, and, and be moping around the house and, and being, you know, grumpy towards my friends and my family. And, and you know, from a mental health perspective, I, I don't see how that benefits my life. If, you know, if the club had given their all and done everything that they could have and should have done, maybe i would be looking at it different. I'll be giving it a bit more, but... Yeah, not not for me this season. Sorry, we'll see next season whether or not they 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 live up to. I guess maybe some might say the high standards that I have for the club. But um, I just think that's the best way for me personally to deal with Liverpool, and and it's working quite well so far. I love it, and I love the fact that you said, "Well, if they can't give it their all, why should I get all angry and agitated?" I was like, "You little diva, I'm here for it." Though, also another thing as well, we're talking about unrest on the pitch. There's so much unrest off the pitch as well. We don't know what's happening with the ownership, and I feel like that needs to be cemented as well, so we know exactly what direction we're going in. Is it a brand new owner? It makes more sense. I think the whole idea of somebody investing a stake in Liverpool, where 
what is the point with FSG? What is the point? Because these people who are going to invest or buy a stake in Liverpool are going to be expected to shell out the money because FSG don't. And then they aren't like the majority holders or whatever. Like, I, I'm not being funny. I'm not, I, I'm not a billionaire. But for me, that just doesn't make any sense. Because if you're being told that you have to shell out the money, then you want to make executive decisions. So I think a full on share um, sale is what is going to sort of, I think, determine the future of Liverpool, in my opinion. I'm on board for a full sale now. I think FSG, they've taken us as far as they can. I don't need a VPN. I've got nothing to hide. <laughs> this is what I used to tell myself before I hooked up with LibertyShield.com. Not only is my home internet now fully encrypted, but I can now access all the websites I want, whenever I want, and do so from absolutely anywhere. As a Liverpool fan, I love to know I can now watch every match, regardless of whether it's on UK TV or not. My Liberty Shield VPN makes sure nothing is blocked and guarantees me super fast streaming speed throughout that match. You can get connected right now with their software package, which includes a 48-hour no-obligation free trial and instant access to their apps for Apple, Android, Fire TV, PC, Mac, and Android TV. Or go a step further like I have and get one of their pre-configured VPN routers. These small but powerful devices allow you to easily connect every device in your home to VPN, making it the perfect solution for smart TVs, mag boxes and games consoles. Visit libertyshield.com today and use coupon code AIVPN25 to get 25% off at checkout. Yeah, but hopefully um, they saw, we can see the way the league is going. Um, it's it's not being stopped going in this direction where owners have to dip into their own pockets. You can't just be self-sustaining and expect to compete with mm -hmm. the clubs that are there at the moment. Um, and now there's another one in Newcastle. So there's, yep. there's, there's an extra one that you're going to have to deal with. And it's probably just a high not... potential as well with them, how deep their pockets are. Exactly. It, it's just not feasible at the moment to go with the model that... Um, more so the model we're using at the moment, maybe the model we're using in the past when Michael Edwards was in power, where you're being the smartest people in the room, but the model we're using at the moment, it, it, it's not going to work with the way football is going in the Premier League. Um, so hopefully they sell, um, they have progress uh, with what they're trying to do with the money once they sell. They've, they've had positive meetings from that sense. So I guess maybe it's just can someone now come in with an offer that um, they're comfortable with to sell? But in terms of where the, they're going to put the money once they've sold Liverpool, it seems to be going in the right direction and they're having positive meetings from that front. Um, because remember, people always forget when you sell a team like, or when you sell a football club, that money has to go somewhere. Like it, it doesn't just go into your ATM or bank, bank account. You know, it's going to have to go and buy another something um and the steps that they've taken to what they're going to buy eventually after they sell liverpool that's going positively they've been positive meetings they're quite confident and comfortable with that side of things it's just now the other side of things of is someone going to come in with the money that we want in order to then you know sell liverpool so that we can go on to the next ventures that that we have plans for yeah, and Shavi, have you got anything to add on into this discussion? I'm personally not invested in the ownership chain. The only thing is, obviously, I would prefer owners who at least fund infra, leave alone on pitch decisions. But I think you are allowed to fund infra if I understood FFP correctly. And I think the, another thing is, as part of new ownership, you are also allowed to invest money into the squad. I think you have more leeway. So I think I would say those are the two positive things. I'm looking at, but personally, I'm more invested in what we do on the pitch. So if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't happen, there's a lot of it. Ultimately, also the final, the as they say, the buck stops with Klopp. So in respect of ownership, if it's, again, we do not know what is true, what is not. If Klopp and his team have a vision and he's the one blocking decisions, then ownership change, not change is not going to do much. So I'm personally not invested in what happens in terms of the ownership. I have no view on it, to be honest.
you two are like amazingly just screened in into perspectives there i'm I'm here for it because i think people just hold on to every single word every single single snippet of news and again that in itself what you two are kind of demonstrating is really good for mental health as well like don't get don't believe every word don't get sucked into every little bit of news right guys i think we've come to the end of the show before i let you go is there anything you want to kind of highlight from the game or something that needs mentioning um Shri, i will come to you first i think second clean sheet I, and no huge chances from open play are the big two takeaways again as i've said conditional on two opposite opponents who don't attack much we'll see whether this is brighton i think again depending on which team brighton put in but they are coached in a very good manner coached by a very good manager so i think it, it will show up because we got shown up by brighton in the transition play i think the big challenge of how this system is set up as a unit we will see in the fa cup but i think clear baby steps have been made and i hope we continue in, as i said purpose and progress i hope there is an upward trajectory that those are my key takeaways from the game I think that's fair and it's good to kind of focus on that kind of positive. Um, to Diva, anything you kind of want to highlight from the game or any 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 situation, um, the floor is yours. Uh, just another positive performance from Basetic and uh, hopefully that midfield has done enough to convince Klopp to start them in the next Premier League game. In the FA Cup, um, he can start whoever he wants for me. I'm, I'm not worried about that. But in the Premier League, hopefully this midfield is a midfield that has done enough to start the next game. Nice. I like it because you want some kind of continuous um, consistency, right? No, I think both those are great shots and great positives, even from a uh, drab performance. I mean, for my part, I just want to kind of say that you know, the club issued a statement before this game, you know, that they, we are against anti-discrimination. We don't like, you know, abuse of any kind, physical, verbal. And um, I think that is how you should watch football. You know, whatever you feel, whatever your differences are, you just you don't air them. You should never air them. And um, I believe that, um, uh, well, we heard the stadium announcer sort of um, suggesting that there was some chanting going on, which it doesn't hold the line with Liverpool Football Club. So um, we don't know the ins and outs of that just yet. So I'm waiting for, you know, I'm sure the club will release a statement, but obviously somebody has reported something. So just be better people, I guess is what I'm trying to say. There's no need for it. It's it's intolerant. Just go and watch the game. And um, that's um, uh, Justin highlighted this to me. So I'm just bringing it forward to you guys because I was just so engrossed in, engrossed in the bullshit of the shit that was going on on the pitch. So I just wanted to highlight that. So guys, um, are you going to give me a man of the match? I have been quite yeah, famous for not giving man of the matches whenever performances don't deserve them, especially in the player ratings show um, that I used to do with Guy Drinkle. So for me, Allison is, is my shot for man of the match. If he's not getting it, I, I, I don't want to give it to anyone. I, I don't know if anyone deserved Nobody really stood that, up for me as it well. other than him. <laughs> yeah, no one really stood up for me as well. I can't lie. Sheree, did anyone stand up for you? And don't say Roberta for me, because no, I will slap you. <laughs> no, I think I think it should be us for sitting through it for 90 minutes and then talking about it for an hour as well. Yes, <laughs> yes. Right. Okay, so I've got... I, I, yeah, my, my man of the match, I'm giving it to two people, is Tadiva and it's Sheree. Okay, we're splitting yes. that. You know, there you go. Please don't get it, my excellent panel do. Guys, thank you so much for jumping on this podcast. I really appreciate it. Where can people find you on social uh, on social media? Anything you'd like to plug as well to do that, I'll come to you. Thank you for the cheap plug earlier. Um, I'm on at Tad Predicts on Twitter. Um, and then you guys can catch me on the EPS, EPL Index channel doing a Tad Predictable podcast where we do previews of um, and score predictions of Premier League game weeks. Uh, we've signed a new person as well. So if Liverpool aren't signing people, at least we, we're signing people. Um, and she's going to be on the show really soon as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited about the, the list of panelists that we've now got available uh, for the show. So yeah, come, come join us. 
incredible stuff do give to diva a follow do check out his show and i love having him on this podcast i remember the old school days when Liverpool was so good and he would tacti- tactically analyze roberta Firmino's movement and i would be in awe because it was better whilst he was describing it than watching it in person but yeah give this guy a follow he's excellent and sheree i'm gonna come to you where can people find you on social media and is there anything you'd like to plug so i in social media, obviously, I post very less, but you can follow me on Twitter at Srikant Bala. The one shout out I think would be the continuous excellent work on Under Pressure, especially in this season, where it must be a horrid show to put yourself through watching the games again and again. I think a big shout out to Under Pressure is what I would say. Could not agree more. And do give Shri a follow. Um, again, he's an excellent guy. Do follow him. When he does talk, um, when he will tweet, it will be um, uh, enriching your timeline. So I can't echo that enough. Give both of these a follow. For my part, um, I'm doing things on, on social media. You can follow me on Twitter, Nina Kauser. I have an Instagram account as well, the Nina Kauser Show. I post little videos on there and things. I'll be back for the next Premier League game, guys. Um, thank you so much for listening. Thank you for everyone that joined us live on Discord. A massive shout out to You Never Walk Alone, Foodie, Rishal and um, the, the Badger Wolf. I really appreciate your questions. Didn't get any callers today. I don't really blame them. Um, guys, thank you so much for listening. Don't let this affect your weekend. Take care. Till next time, up the Reds. We hope you enjoyed listening to this Anfield Index show. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel so future podcasts find their way to your device automatically. There's nothing quite like fan engagement, and we'd love to know what you think of anything discussed on this show. The best way to get in touch is over on our free Discord community, where both podcasters and listeners debate the hottest LFC topics 24-7. Sign up free now at anfieldindex.com forward slash discord. You won't regret it. You can also follow us on Twitter at Anfield Index and find us on Facebook by searching for Anfield Index. Oh, and before you go, we'd love it if you could leave us a five-star review on your favourite podcast app. It only takes a couple of seconds and it means the world to the people who create these free shows.